Now, it's a real joy to be with you here tonight in this preaching mission. I have been thrilled night after night as I have visited various places and participated in the various services. Last night in Gate City and the night before in Elizabethton, today at noon over at Elizabethton, out at Steed College, I believe, sometime during the day, and over at the school, uh, high school in Elizabethton the day before. It's a joy to share tonight this pulpit with Dr. Matthews. I thought that uh, he and I here tonight speaking reminded me of the story I heard of the two ladies. They both owned the Volkswagen. Now, for those of you who know the Volkswagen, uh, the motor is in what we normally think here in America as the trunk. And where the motor normally is, there is nothing more than a luggage compartment, no motor at all. And these two ladies had Volkswagens, and one was riding down the street one day, and it broke down with her. And she was out trying to investigate. If you can imagine a woman out trying to investigate what's wrong with a car, she was giving it the once-over. And uh, the other lady passed by with her Volkswagen, and so she stopped in front of her, and the lady pulled up the hood of the car that was broke down and said, well, no wonder the car won't run. The motor's gone. And the other lady jerked up the trunk of her car and said, don't worry about it. I've got a spare motor right here. <laughs> well, we've got the spare motor here tonight. If I break down, Dr. Matthews will carry right on. A few months ago, I recall on one Sunday night, family coming into the church, and they came early that night and sat on the second pew. And that in itself is a strange thing anymore because people who come early normally go to the back of the church to find a place they'd like to sit. And I thought it just a little strange. At the close of that service, this man and his wife came forward asking that we help them find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He was a professor and is now a professor in one of the universities in our city there. And after the service, he asked to talk with me. And some words that he said made a great impression upon my mind. Now he said, Preacher, from all outward appearances, I have been somewhat of a success in life. A man can't be on the staff at Georgia Tech unless he is. And I found that regardless of my family background, regardless of the things that I have enjoyed so far as successes are concerned, I am a wretched individual. My wretchedness sometimes almost overwhelms me. When he said that, the words that I shall use tonight for a text came to my mind. The words of the Apostle Paul when he said in Romans 7:24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Tonight for a topic I will talk to you on the wretched state of man. Paul cried out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I believe that the conflicts that must have gone on in the bosom of what we were to know later as the Apostle Paul, or even at this time when he was writing, doubtless expresses a feeling that is felt across the land and country and around the world in this day in which you and I live. I believe there are many reasons that one can be led into a life of wretchedness. Now, I'm not saying necessarily so, but these are some facts that may lead people into a state of wretchedness. The fact that you and I are what I'm calling tonight creatures of necessity makes this true. There is not a one of us that chose our family background. There is not a one of us that came into this world by our own choice. We are what I'm calling a creature of necessity. In other words, we suddenly find a life on our hand, we've got to do something with it. We can't just toss it aside. Sometimes folk who find they're not able to, uh, under, to undergo the strain of life, they try to find an easy way out, a method of escape, or sometimes suicide. But for the most part, we realize we have a life on our hands and something must be done with it. And this fact in itself leads many people into a state of wretchedness. 
We realize not only are we born, but we realize that there will come a time of death, and sometimes our attitudes about death can cause us to find ourselves in a wretched state. Regardless of whether we face it, as the writer William Cullen Bryant said, as a triumph of individual or as a coward, we still must face death. You remember the portion of his famous writing that said, Thou go not like the quarry slave at night, scourged to his dungeon, but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust, approach thy grave, like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. But these facts that surround us may cause us into, to find ourselves in a, in a condition of what I'm calling tonight a wretched state. Not only so, but the fact that we are creatures of worry. I don't know whether you've heard us label such before, and yet we all know it's a fact. We are creatures of worry. This is not true of the dog or of the cat or of animals that roam the fields. It simply is not true. They give no thought for tomorrow. They simply think that tomorrow there will be provided the necessities, and nature leads them from one place to another instinct, but not so with us. We worry. We hear the master as he challenges us to give no thought for tomorrow because he knew that our minds constantly were worrying about things. And oftentimes the fact that we find ourselves creatures of worry may cause us to be under a great burden may cause us to be a creature that may be described as wretched. Then I believe the fact that you and I have before us, we're given by God the power of decision also may lead an individual into a state of wretchedness. We have so many things that we have to make a decision about. Have you thought about it? I'm sure you have. The mother gets up in the morning, she must decide what the children's going to wear to school. She must decide what's going to be fixed for the noonday meal. She must decide what we're going to have for dinner. She must decide the various things, decisions, decisions. And the dad goes to the office and constantly he's faced by decision. This in itself could cause us that we're not very cautious and unless we understand how to face life, may cause us to be a wretched individual. We must make decisions and some of these decisions are of great importance. There is no greater decision than that one that we must make as it relates to our eternal soul. It's a decision a man must make, and sometimes the failure to face these issues may cause us to be in a wretched state. I believe that these and many other things may have led Paul to feel as he did, and yet I may say tonight and shock you somewhat, when I say that I don't believe that these things in themselves really is the basic cause of the great wretchedness of mankind, neither in the personal state nor so far as the world is concerned. I said today, preaching another sermon over at Elizabethtown, and repeat tonight that I don't believe that the world is in the condition that it is in now simply because that communistic forces are aloof in the face of the earth. Now, I believe that Russian communism that does not appreciate the dignity of an individual. I believe it's godless and I believe it holds no place in the plan of God. And yet, that in itself cannot bring forth the wretchedness that our world finds tonight. The personal state of mankind is not due to that neither, nor is the state of our world. Nor do I believe that political corruption basically calls forth the wretchedness that we find ourselves in in this hour. Though I believe that corruption in political affairs is undermining the democratic processes that you and I enjoy. Nor do I believe that the wretched state of the world is due to parental or to juvenile delinquency. Though truly delinquency threatens the moral fibers of our society, but this in itself cannot be the thing that calls forth all the wretched state. I believe that Isaiah, many years ago, diagnosed the condition of his day and of ours. And I believe that underlying all of these other things that I have said may lead one to wretchedness, I believe rests this one fact, this one truth, that at the base or at the bottom of all of these things, there lies, as Isaiah describes it, the hand of the Lord is not sharp that he cannot help you, his ears are not deaf that he will not hear you, but your iniquities have come between you and your God. 
your sins have hid his face from you. That comes rolling down to our society. It comes rolling down to our world and to that person that finds himself in a wretched state. Your sins have caused this wretchedness. Sometimes I'm amazed that we're not able to understand that it's spiritual emptiness that really brings forth wretchedness. It's the lack of a proper relationship with God. It's the failure to find ourselves in a right relationship with God and with our fellow man. You know, sometimes we make salvation religion so complicated, but I'm ever thrilled at the truth that Jesus made it so simple. Those about him, while they were coming forth with great philosophies and ideas, Jesus simply looked at the trees and gave them an example. He saw the birds flying overhead and taught them. He, ta he talked about things that people understood. Now he said, the basic truths of religion rest in these two facts. Love God with all of your heart and your fellow man as yourself. And oh, if we only knew that. So much of the wretchedness of our society, of our day, of our cities, and of our world could be overcome suddenly if we realized that right relationship with God and with our fellow man relieves this state of wretchedness. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul's condition. Some would say that Paul was wretched because he did not have a good family background, but this could not be the case. Because Paul had a good family background, he said of himself, and if you're taking notes and would like the scripture in 2 Corinthians 11:22, why he said, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Why Paul said that I am an Israelite of the Israelites. I am of the seed of Abraham. It could not have been family background that called forth this wretchedness of Paul. Nor could it have been in the case of Paul a lack of an educational background. For Paul said of himself, I was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, and Gamaliel was one of the great teachers of that day. So he had the family background, he had the background that was necessary so far as the educational requirements of his day were concerned, and yet he still lacked in something when he cried, Oh, wretched man that I am. Now here again as a preacher, I suppose I may somewhat shock you when I tell you that he did not lack a religious background. For he had a religious background. He said of himself in Acts 22 and 3, before his conversion, I was zealous toward God. And yet he cries out, I'm a wretched man. Something was lacking. Some, some concept or some idea, some thought or some experience was still lacking in the bosom of this man. And he cries out, oh, wretched man that I am. Yet I believe that Paul found his own solution in the very next verse when he comes forth in thundering tones and he says, I thank God that through Jesus Christ I found a solution to my wretchedness. In other words, he said these other things did not, uh, they, they were not sufficient, but finally he came forth with a glorious statement when he saw or had a vision of Christ, and he said, now, he said, my victory is in him. And I don't believe there is a one under the sound of my voice that can say, I am not wretched, until they come to understand that where we have failed, Christ makes the difference. Wherein we have been sinners, we turn to the righteousness of Christ. Wherein we have been failures, we turn to the triumphs in Christ. And then we can say with the apostle Paul, I triumph in Christ, or he leadeth me daily into victories. I read a poem a number of years ago and wrote it down, and it's been a challenge to me again and again. And I believe that Paul, though he did not know this poem, the thought that's given in this poem of, of Samuel Carter, surely Paul must have understood when he said, I am made to cry up in Christ my Lord. Hear the words of a school teacher. Jesus face to face. I have walked life's path with an easy tread, have followed where comfort and pleasure led, and then it chanced in a quiet place. I met my master face to face. With station, rank, and wealth for a goal, much thought for the body and none for the soul, I had entered to win in life's mad race. And I met my Savior face to face. 
I had built my castles and reared them high with their towers that pierced the blue of the sky. I had sworn to rule with an iron mace. And I met my master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. And I faltered and fell at his feet that day, and all of my castles vanished away. Melted and vanished, and in their place I saw no else but my master's face. And I cried aloud, Oh, make me neat to follow the marks of thy wounded feet. My thought is now for the souls of men. I have lost my life to find it again. Ere since alone in a quiet place, my master and I stood face to face. I believe out of the night of wretchedness that Paul must have stood face to face and he must have seen God's revelation in Christ and he said, here is my victory now in Jesus I triumph. He is the answer to my problems. I believe tonight that our solution is the same. I believe that to overcome wretchedness still it rests in the simple story of the cross, the story of Jesus still is our victory and our triumph. I'm thrilled when I read the 8th chapter of Romans. I read it because in there I find the promises of victory through Christ. Let me call your attention to a few of those promises that you will find in the 8th chapter of Romans. Paul said that he is our victory in Romans 8, beginning with verse 1, hear it from God's word. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation, there is now no wretchedness if we walk in Christ Jesus. There is no substitute for that. Then again, Paul says that we are made to be sons of God by adoption through Jesus Christ. In other words, we come to be sons of God. I read again, starting with verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now we feel that family relationship with God. We feel that we belong in the world. Suddenly life takes on a sense of direction. Wretchedness is gone when we realize that through Christ we become sons of God. I remember hearing a story some few years ago from a friend of mine who is now a missionary in Africa. He told of a young, uh, of a child, of a boy who had been adopted into the family of a quite a wealthy and said the boy went out one day and he looked over the property and he came to the place where some nice automobiles, I don't know what kind they were, perhaps Cadillacs or something of the sort, and said the chauffeur was standing around and the little boy started looking them over and the chauffeur said to him, now, I'm sorry, son, you'll have to run along and play. The man of the house does not allow children to be walking through the garage. The little boy went back into the house. The man did not know that he was the son that had been adopted. So he went back into the house, and the dad came in after a while, and the son said, Dad, I went out to see the car. And the little fell out there. I don't know who he was, but he ran me away. He scared me off. The dad said to him, Son, you go back out there, and you tell that fellow, you're my son. And you tell that fellow to get up in the front seat of that car and drive you around the block. And you just make yourself right at home. And that little fellow threw his shoulders back and walked out to the garage and looked up into his eyes and said, Say, Charlie, I want to go for a ride. He suddenly realized he belonged. This was his property. We have no right in this world until suddenly we realize this is God's property and ours only as we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we find we belong. The eighth chapter of Romans reminds us again that he is our priest. What a glorious privilege it is to stand before God in Christ. No wonder he said he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And because of his victories, let us therefore come boldly that we may stand before God. Because of him, he is our victory. Through him we have the right to stand before God. 
This is what Paul is saying, oh, how wicked I would be were it not for the fact that Jesus is my high priest. Then he says again, he is our Savior in verse 32. My wife and I have two daughters, and we think they're quite charming. One is nine and one is five. The one that's five, her name is Susan Joy, and she really is a bundle of joy. I was shaving the other day, and I was in the room next to where the girls were playing, and I heard Joy really gave Becky down, down the road, so to speak. She called her everything but a little lady. And she didn't know that I was listening, and so I let her finish. I thought they say it's good, you know, to get it out of your system, so I let her get it out. But when she got finished, I called. I said, Joy, you disappointed Daddy so much, I didn't know you talk like that. It breaks my heart. And she looked up with eyes that only a child could look, and she said, Well, Daddy, the Sunday school teacher told me the other day that God would erase things. You would pray. She said, I'll go here in the room and pray and ask God to erase it. Oh, I better go do that and see what God says. And so she went and prayed a while, and she really prayed. Sometimes in that prayer she must have thought, now it's going to do me no good if God erases this and my dad doesn't erase it because he still may get with me. And I'm a little old-fashioned to do that every now and then, but it's necessary. So she came back and looked up at me, and she said, Dad, God said he had erased it. He told me to tell you to erase it. That's certainly putting it in very simple terms, and yet that's what God does for us in Christ. Our sins are erased. Our sins are forgiven when we in just a childlike faith. Oh, there's more to it. Sure we know there's more to it. There must be a follow-up. There must be other things for training, but yet that point of forgiveness when God kisses away our sins. And then the Apostle Paul could cry, Who can separate me from the love of God? It can't be done. Famine, death, none of these things will separate me from God in Christ. Our victory rests in him tonight, just as it did in him so many years ago when the Apostle Paul was writing this epistle. Several years ago, my dad, who also was a priest, was called to the state of South Carolina to go with six men were to die at one time or during one evening in the electric chair. Morning, I've forgotten the time. I shall never forget how the family, the two or three of those boys, have requested several preachers, and among them my dad, to spend the last night with those boys. Now, you say, preacher, I don't believe in conversion under those conditions. I don't believe the Bible, because the Bible said that the soul is false. The very last hour recognized the Savior next to him. I give that to you in the background. Six boys who were to die the next morning. Five of those boys during that night, with a glorious experience, accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, or already had accepted Christ before that hour. One called himself an infidel. My dad said the next morning, for the time for the execution, that one man walked that cell and how long do we have? While the five boys who had really made a commitment to Christ sat and sang and praised God for the new experience they had found in Christ. But imagine wretchedness known under such conditions. That was the same thing Paul and Silas experienced. How else could they have sung in, in prison at the midnight hour in stocks? How else could they have sung praises to God? Just as these boys would say because they had met the wretchedness of God. Life had taken a new experience. Then the hour came for the execution, and right into the little room the preacher stood, and two or three fainted and were taken out, but that remained on. And he said, after a while, they brought one who called himself an infidel. And they brought the first of the five and called himself a Christian, and said, well, the black cap was placed over his face, and heard music in the room. And he turned to look at the preacher that was near him, and he heard all their lips were not moving, and he thought, where could this song be coming from? Safe in the arms of Jesus. He looked under the
with a black cap, fair moon, chin, and being excellent. I know it isn't a lovely picture in a way, and yet when the current struck him, he said his note went into a high pitch. And he went home to leave it alone. The old wretched man that I am, who should have ever been, calls that I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can come unto thee and say, Abba, Father, for thou art our own dear Heavenly Father. We are grateful for the revelation in Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we come to this moment and we ask that thy spirit may move across this congregation, that our decisions being made now in hearts and lives. May thy spirit speak and thou knowest the preparation that's been made by these ministers and the card that's in these hands. So many places where we can say, I am determined to follow him. Grant, O oh God, that those decisions may be real tonight. Grant, O oh Lord, thy blessings upon each one we pray in the remaining part of this service. And when that moment of the final decision shall come, may thy grace and power rest and abide upon them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.